I'm really excited here to spend time with Diane Green, who, who's a friend, but I also consider her as um, you know, a former boss and mentor of mine in my career. I was lucky enough to intern for uh, VMware in 2003, was in grad school, and it, it was a small you know, technology company of a couple hundred employees and that no one really, really got. And then 2004, people were like, you know, at business school, why, why are you going to this company? Like, the smartest people I've ever met worked at VMware. And, and, <laughs> and you know, they always, the advice I always give folks that ask me for job or career advice is find the smaller, smartest people and go work with them because you just, you're going to learn a ton. So uh, Diane uh, Green was founder of a couple companies, but you know, most um, famously, at least most recently, she was founder and CEO of VMware, which she co-founded with her husband Mendel, who's a professor here at Stanford, in 1998 with uh, three of the grad students, Ed, Ellen, and Scott. And then Diane was uh, talk about you know, scale up or blitz scaling. She was CEO and founder of the company from those first five individuals in a small office in town and country to over you know, 7,000 employees, $2 billion plus in revenue, plus an IPO. Um, and so it's just an amazing journey from going from zero to two billion and to 7,000 employees. And so, um, and, and on top of that, now Diane is co-founder CEO of another company, which we will, might talk a little bit about, you know, what she's learned uh, the first time she scaled up a company to this time. And, and in addition to that, she's on the board of Google, she's on the board of Intuit, Khan Academy, and a small technical college in Massachusetts called MIT. <laughs> Anyway, um, why don't we just all welcome Diane Green. Thank you. Yeah. So Jerry made VMware fun. So <laughs> when he asked me, I was like, oh, this will be really fun. You guys should have fun with Jerry. He, he, he loves to be teased. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not on this all this tonight, but thank you. Well, speaking of... of of, of fun and culture, when we yeah. start with that around people, and I, I know if, there, if there's questions mm -hmm. and students, I think Diana, like, feel free to raise your hand and, and ask questions throughout the conversation um, because we, we can steer the topics which way you want. But let's talk about culture when you, when you scale up. VMware was doubling in headcount pretty much every year, if not every other quarter. You know, it, it's, just, it's just increasing a bunch of people. How do you keep hiring um, and keeping both hiring the right people and keeping the culture strong? in those early days? Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, the hardest, most difficult hiring was in the very beginning because we couldn't convince, I mean, we had this idea that was, we hadn't exactly refined our elevator pitch and, and you know, convincing people to come was, was a big deal. And so each person, yeah. it's really interesting because right now I have a startup and each person is a big deal. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're hiring 100 people a month and, and it's easier. <laughs> but um, so you ha can remember that it will get easier, but, but, but so you can never drop your standards, okay. obviously. And, and that's why it gets easier is if you create a strong culture and, and really good people, um, then when people and and you know when people come in and it speaks to them, you know it's sort of fun. It's got the right look for them. Yeah. You know we we were competing with Google when we were building VMware, and I just can't quite believe I'm on the board right now because <laughs> I did not like them. And and <laughs> well, there's a story about people searching for VMware on Google, right? And you would see. Oh yeah, my husband Mendel, who's a CS professor here, they put. If you searched his name, it said, want a job at Google? <laughs> and we were like, you can't do that. And, and, <laughs> and uh, but, yeah, so, well, I mean, we started out friends. Yeah. And we used to go to each other's parties. And then we realized we were competing for talent. Yeah. And we never talked to each other. And then we got really kind of annoyed with each other. And actually, when I... I'm digressing, but when I joined the board of Google, Larry and Sergey said one of the reasons we hired Diane is VMware was the only company we lost people to. <laughs> and where, when they lost people, it was generally because, and this says a lot about our culture, uh, we found that people that had a big hobby, like they raced bicycles or... Um, you know, they, they just, they like to go backpacking sometimes or did different things besides just work. They would, or if they're a little older and just starting a family, they would tend to want to join us. 
And if they really wanted a way, you know, a full yeah. 24 by 7 experience at work, they went to Google because Google was running a 24 by 7 service. And, and that was kind of how it split out. And I, we got a lot done in our work days, but we didn't have nearly as long hours as Google. One of the things you, you talk about is this um, autoimmune system when yes. hiring, bringing people in, or and you would say you'd be great at hiring and great at firing or both, right? And so talk about this concept of a, a cultural or autoimmune system at VMware. Yeah, actually, my new company has it too. It just happens magically. And what it is <coughs> is you get a, a critical mass of really good people, and when you bring someone in that just isn't like, People aren't liking their check-ins or, you know, if they're an engineer or they're just not keeping up with the conversation, they kind of self-elect to leave. And, and that is the most effective thing you can have to keep the quality of people. I mean, you have to watch and, and help someone leave if they're the wrong person, but I can think of a few examples. We hired a performance engineer, and two weeks later, he left. Mm. He's like, oh, I'm in the wrong place for me. And I remember hiring a VP of engineering <laughs> at one point, and, and three weeks into his tenure, we had an offsite, and and... I thought he was fine. He didn't say much, but right after the offsite, he came in my office and sat down. He looked really shaken. I, what's wrong? And he said, "I, I really couldn't keep up. I really didn't know what was going on." And I'm like, "What do you?" Oh, I said, "Oh, there's so much to learn. You, don't worry, you'll get up to speed." And he goes, "No, no, I mean it. This is, you know." And then I realized he wasn't going to make it because he just didn't have the confidence. I, I actually think he was smart enough, but he just, and so I said, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> when you scale that fast from, you know, 100 to 1,000 to, you know, 10,000, there's always this tension between promoting from within versus hiring folks from the outside that either have seniority or domain experience. How, how do you balance that, and how do you think about that? So whenever I went to hire the first of something, I really yeah. went for just as much talent as we could yeah. possibly find, and I didn't I mean, maybe it was my naivety, but I did not go for someone that had been a VP senior person. I just want for the, so for instance, Jason, who ran professional yeah. services, or Jeff, who ran uh, SEs. So these were two, one, so one of them, actually, who, who was a Stanford grad, ran the track team. Yep, Jason Martin, cross-country team here. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but he had been at two companies running s professional services. I think he had been a first-line manager at, you know, they weren't all that big. And I met him, and this guy was just so driven and so sharp and just the nicest person in the world. And so he came in as an individual contributor, and he scaled that organization up to, I don't know, it got to about 1,200 yeah, people. Yeah, over 1,000, not just the U.S., worldwide. And not only did he scale it up, you know, without a hitch, I had thought we would have to run professional services cash neutral. <laughs> he ran it as a profit center. He was like, no way, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to be a prof, yeah. not on my watch. <laughs> and that guy was amazing. Um, and so it was just wonderful to have him grow up with the company because he, it, you know, made, yeah. he understood the company, he, under, he knew how it worked, he knew everybody at the company, and he was, you know, he knew the nuts and bolts of it from being an individual contributor. And the same thing, we hired this guy who had been a pilot um, in Maybe. a in the Navy, and I always hire a military guy if you can. They are the best. They're so disciplined. And, and especially in anything approaching sales. I really love military people. And, and never had one of them go wrong. Um, but, um, and anyhow, he came in as an individual contributor doing sales engineering, and he built that team out to yeah. quite large, yeah. Yeah, he's still there. And he's still there, yeah. And I remember when VMware, could, we could all fit in one um, lunchroom, and every Wednesday, yeah. you would stand up, and we just, in a room small of this, and we just tell everyone what happened that week, what's happening next week. And then, obviously, that, that communication, the transparency was great, but then you're, you're a public company. The company's, you know, several thousand. How do you maintain that, that communication at that scale? 
Right. It gets, it does get hard. One thing, one little thing I was going to mention that I personally loved um, about, and I'm sure none of you have a problem with this, but I was very shy and very um, self-conscious and got nervous in front of people when I started VMware. But when you give a talk every week in front of a growing company, you know, before you know it, you're talking to a few thousand people, but but it, since it happens so gradually, yeah. you're not nervous anymore. And that's how I conquered my fear of being in front of people. And, and uh, but in terms of um, how do you keep the communication up? I mean, as we got bigger, we sent out, you know, if there's much better mechanisms <laughs> today. <laughs> we sent emails out yeah. to everybody. Uh, we did have big all hands. Uh, but the other thing that was really good that I thought worked very well at VMware was er, uh, every Monday uh, we had a staff meeting and I had a requirement that everybody on my staff, they could, I said, you're welcome to do it Friday, but by nine o'clock Sunday night, you got to get me. And it's not a status report. What it is, is a write up of anything going on in your group that everybody else should know about or anything that you need to coordinate with your peers take advantage of this meeting. And you had they had to send it to me every Sunday night by nine and then at nine o'clock I would co you know put it all together and then I would write mine and highlight what I thought was important or anything I thought I wanted to tell people about. And then I would uh, give that out to everybody. And, and that meeting, I also always invited the founders. So particularly Ed Bunyan always came, Scott came to a lot of them. And, and they were you know, individual contributors in the engineering organization. And I always thought that contributed hugely to the culture because everybody knew that these two engineers were in every staff meeting, so there were no secrets. They could just go ask these guys, hey, what's going on? You know, and they would just tell them, so it was a way to get the information out. Yeah. And um, and then the other thing was that this staff report went out to everybody, to to my staff, and then they could selectively share it with their staff. And the funniest thing happened because I never asked anybody to, but they st everybody started had making their staff by Friday get them <laughs> the same write up. Yep. And um, I hear people still do it over there. I, I still remember uh, Diane, basically, I was a young product manager calling in or emailing about some customer interaction I had <laughs> on an early beta product. So Diane read all the, all, everything that was going on in the company. Yeah, at, it's invaluable. It, because it, it, at that stage, it was, it was a great way to understand Really dense, quickly. Yeah. It's so efficient. There's nothing more efficient than that. Yeah. It's roughly similar, although... Uh, uh, just a uh, question is, uh, with the yeah. new company, are you planning to do this communication same or, or different with, with new tools? Yeah, it's really interesting. My new company has a lot of very different kinds of people. Um, it has designers, which are... Um, how many people here are designers? I, 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 they're... I've never worked with designers before. I have incredible respect for them, but um, they, they're they challenging for me. And <laughs> <coughs> and I, I wish I could do what they can do, so I'm very at their mercy. And, um, and they do incredible things. But, but so you have designers who are sort of not in the habit of doing something like that. And then you have all the other people who don't mind doing some, writing this this up. And, and so I, I've been using it to kind of get everybody t to know how to communicate with each other. We're not really using it to run the company because we're small enough, we don't need it. But it's been invaluable as a way to get everybody to kind of speak the same language and care about the same things because we're all so different. It's been an interesting purpose. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been super valuable. Um, but the other thing that thing is so good for is when you get too bigger, is when you bring in a new, like I brought in a new CFO and a new head of sales, and I said, here, go read all these <laughs> and you'll know exactly what's been going on. And nowadays people go, here, go search Slack and read all the interesting channels and you'll know what's going on. Maybe I want to move from um, people to talk about the product, so you go from the, more of the, on the product side. 
you know, VMware started with um, selling workstation via download, and then later um, yeah. this thing we call shrink wrap software, Fry, is where people actually you know buy CDs, and, and then added you know uh, GSX server, then ESX server. And one of the questions I always wonder is like, how do you know when to add new products, new product lines? Because a lot of companies start out they have a hit product, they ride it, and sometimes they don't come up with the second act or third act, third second third product. So how how do you know when, and how do you um, how did you guys create this culture of, of, of finding, experimenting new products, like starting the desktop business, for example? Well, we actually wanted to, I mean, our vision was to build the server product. And we're like, nobody's going to put our, you know, nobody's going to remove their operating system and put our, quote, bare bones hypervisor operating system on their hardware and run all their mission critical workloads. This, this is not going to happen. You know, so what can we do and how can we test this software? So so we wanted to do the bare metal hypervisor, um, but we went, that's just not going to fly. We have to be much less disruptive. So then we're like, sort of Linux was just happening and we had this idea, how about if we did it on as a tool to run Windows applications with Linux yeah. and we can get the, the heart of our system was this very difficult piece of code called a binary translator and we can that for the x86 architecture you don't have to it's not so hard anymore because of the hardware assist but anyhow um, you know we can really get the bugs out of that so so we said well, let's build this tool and the problem, we, we'll build it on the desktop, but then we had this terrible problem of all the devices, and we couldn't possibly write a device driver for all the, you know, because we were basically the OS. So we had the, I Mendel actually had the idea, oh, we'll just have Windows there, which has all the devices, and we'll pretend like Windows is running, and then we'll shove it out of the way and pass, you know, use its device drivers, but we won't, but we'll take over the system. And then we'll be a tool to run Windows with Linux and we'll see if people like this and we'll get all the bugs out of our system. And Linux was just happening and everybody thought we were geniuses because Linus Torvalds got put on the cover of Time and they're like, how did you know? And we didn't, we got really lucky. But, um, uh, but and a, a bunch of companies tried to buy us as a Linux yeah. tool. Back then, and, and so the question around that is, is: is the first product market fit you had was around Workstation, this like Windows on Linux, yeah, and Linux on Windows. And you're right; you could have gotten stuck, and people could. There have was you another there. company that tried to go into the server yeah. first. They weren't doing yeah. the technology we were doing, but they had a, they were kind of a container company. Yeah. there were two container companies that tried to go into the server business, and neither of them made it. So when did you know to revisit the original vision to go to the server? Well, we were building both products from day one. Yeah. And, but what happened was uh, sort of funny because, um, you know, the desktop business did pretty well. You know, we got that thing to $100 million in revenue. And we were pretty happy about that but because um, we thought – we thought we might have to give it away. We weren't positive because Linux users. But um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we figured we made more money on Linux than any other software company. That's probably true. And, um, but anyhow, so even though Michael Dell, this is a very funny anecdote because he just bought, v he's trying to buy VMware. He was quoted in CNN, he invested in us. Am I jumping around too much? No, it's great. Okay. He invested in us, and he was quoted, he said, I'm investing in a lot of Linux companies because I want to equalize the playing field against Microsoft. I'm not going to make any, I'm going to lose money on all of them, <laughs> VMware, Linux, Care. <laughs> You know how many billions of dollars he's paying for VMware right now? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Anyhow, because, um, you know, when you're the CEO of a company, you don't really like seeing Michael Dell quoted as saying he's going to lose money on his investment in you. Well, it's I mean, not I don't think the audience <laughs> realizes this. With Workstation, $100 million, VMware was cash flow positive. We were cash flow positive from day one. Day one. Right, which is amazing. But we ran the company at break even. We, you know, we just ran it at break even. But, um, uh, but what happened was, 
um, we were going to bring out this hypervisor, you know, this bare metal way to do virtualization. Does everybody know what, does anybody want an explanation of virtualization since we're talking about it so much? Okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So Sorry. basically, it's a, it's a layer of software that sits in between the hardware and the operating system, and it kind of masquerades as hardware. And so it, what it does is multiplex the hardware, so you can run multiple virtual machines at the same time, and you can run any operating system you want, as long as it's you know, binary compatible with the chipset, um, in that virtual machine. And so that had benefits on the PC because you could run Linux and Windows together uh, or DOS and, and Windows 95. And, and, and then on the server, it solved all kinds of scalability problems because um, we mostly benefited from Microsoft's bad operating system that you could only run one application on it. Like database vendors and whatnot would only let you, if you wanted support, you could only run their software on the operating system. So, so these servers were vastly underutilized. And so, what we let you do is run one per virtual machine, and then all of a sudden you got the utilization up. But, um, but, but what happened was we went to bring out the server product, ESX Server. Yeah. You know what the name is? Yes, yeah. I do. And <laughs> and we went to bring this thing out. And we launched it, and nothing happened. And, and nobody was buying it. You know. And meanwhile, we had also had this idea we could take our desktop product and repurchase purpose it as a server product. We barely did anything. We just said, it's a server product. It's <laughs> renamed the renamed And we called it GSX, GSX Server. Yeah. And people liked that, yeah. and they were buying that. But we just couldn't get them to buy ESX Server. So then we invented the preferred hardware vendor program. And we, um, we told all the hardware vendors that everybody was signing up to the preferred hardware vendor program. And here was the deadline. And you had to have someone willing to support this. And you had, you know, you had to someone willing to take it to market. And we had to get all these people. So we went to HP and Compaq. And uh, they weren't merged yet. And, and Dell and IBM. And um, Anyhow, they all got worried and signed up for the <laughs> preferred hardware vendor program. And so we relaunched ESX Server. Nobody knew we had already launched it once. Um, and um, anyhow, so let's, let's that worked out that time. Let's talk about that. So early for ESX Server, um, using these partners, IBM, HP, and Dell, and Compaq were, were key channel partners. So yeah. You know, that helps scale, you know, and I'll, uh, I remiss for not explaining virtualization in the beginning of class. I mean, VMware started in 98. For the first 11 years, it was the fastest growing enterprise software company in the history of tech, faster than Oracle, Microsoft, Veritas, uh, in terms of revenue growth. And it was based upon the technology that Diane Mendel and the founders built. Um, but part of that super scale was a great product to find the right channel, the right go to market. So maybe talk a little bit about. Um, the relationship with IBM, HP, and Dell, and the server folks, and you know, how do you how do you use them? How do you stay neutral between all these parties? Yeah, yeah, it was great. I mean, we basically were pretty uh, channel neutral. We had every channel. We had telesales. We had direct sales. We had resellers. We had value added resellers. But but our our focus was really on the hardware vendors. And I took this attitude that we were going to be Switzerland, which you don't see in too many companies. It worked extraordinarily well for us. But I don't, for some reason, people, you know, they get a deal and they're willing to give it exclusive or preferential rights, you know, when they do their partnerships. And you see it all the time. But I, um, I said, no, we, run, we need to run on all these hardware platforms. Th and, and I had an algorithm. I said... Customers first. What's good for the customers is good for the partners and good for us. Partners second. What's good for the partners is also good for us. And, and we came last. And that works so well. So if you use that algorithm, you, want, you don't want to do preferential treatment to a hardware vendor because who knows what hardware your customers want to run on. So I wanted to be Switzerland. So I told all the hardware vendors, we're going to treat you all exactly the same. Here's the terms. If you take us into an account, we promise not to tell anybody else about the account. 
and and we'll work with you and and we'll put people dedicated people on on your hardware on your storage if if you're you know support that with us and if you develop something proprietary with us we'll keep it proprietary for you and if we develop it we'll share it across all the hardware vendors and we just had this whole sort of dance worked out that was very clear to everybody in fact we actually wrote it down eventually as rules of engagement and and sent it to all of them and I told our salespeople they'd be fired if they ever violated it. I only had to fire one salesperson in the whole history of VMware for that. And and um so so anyhow, so we did this neutral thing and they would argue with us, but they went, you know, I think they liked it cuz they knew they could trust us. Yeah. Well, I mean, most famously, even after EMC bought VMware, you doubled down yeah. on that neutrality, almost the fact that all the partners, well, IBM, got me Meta, fired eventually, but... <laughs> <laughs> but customers yeah. first, yeah. right? Yeah. To, to your yeah. credit, you yeah. did the right thing for the customers in yeah. the early days, saying, like, yeah. no, we're going to actually treat every other storage company equally, if not better, because it's right for the customers. Right. And it worked. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, they were just a humongous channel for us. And we had that added complication that a lot of our customers were running Microsoft, I'll, I'll just finish this, and then we're running Microsoft operating systems, and Microsoft wouldn't uh, let us support Microsoft running in our virtual machines, and enterprise customers aren't going to run software that's unsupported. So then the hardware vendors became extraordinarily important to us because they all had support contracts with Microsoft. And they didn't mind having some leverage over Microsoft, so we got them all to do the frontline support for Windows when it ran on their hardware in our virtual machines. So we had IBM, HP, and Dell doing, um, giving the support contract to our customers if the customers wanted that, and so we didn't get hurt at all by Microsoft's tactics there. It's amazing, right? Do you think about yeah. Oracle tries to do in terms of support yeah. for Microsoft early days? Having friends early like uh, the, the OEMs was, was critical. Yeah, it was huge. Chris had a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said something about if, you, if they took you into an account, then you wouldn't sell So for instance, if if, um, so just the question is um, clarifying. Yeah. When Diane said if, if a partner took VMware into a customer account, uh, the, the, st the statement would we would not tell the other partners. The other right. OEMs. So, so if our sales guy went in with an IBM person to an IBM customer, and that sales guy happened to be best buddies with the HP sales guy, they couldn't tell the HP sales guy about that deal. That was very important. Why did they care? What? Why did HP or HP will come in and try to strike well, the if deal? They, if they know someone's in the market to buy some virtualization, so we had this wonderful thing. If you bought virtualization, you ended up buying a ton of hardware. So, so oh, that customer's going to buy a bunch of VMware. I want to sell the hardware. <laughs> so in, in terms of thinking about this strategy yeah. and using partners for, for the folks learning, it, for every dollar of VMware sales, generate eight to ten dollars of storage servers and add-on services around it, mm -hmm. and so they they could make a ton of money. So they could give the VMware away for free. Oh, that HDA stuff it got even higher. Yeah, it got even higher to yeah. like twelve or fourteen. Yeah. They could give VMware for free and make their the, all the margin back on on the storage and the servers, and so it was um it was a hugely profitable partnership for these companies. Um, let's talk about the, the the sales then organization and scaling that out from you know single individuals like uh, Jeff doing the first SE um, and then adding more sales reps and more territories. Um, let's talk about when do you one question startups always have when they hit the scale up is do they hire sales too early or too slow because they they typically their expense if they don't make their number then it doesn't look great. So how do you think about when to, you know, put your, put a poorly gas, we will, on, on that aspect of the business? So we, um, you know, this was pretty new territory for us, and we're like, a salesperson, we got to go find a salesperson. We didn't even really know what they looked like. And um, 
Um, I remember one of our first was this amazing woman who was a stand-up comic. <laughs> she made a really good salesperson. And, um, but anyhow, I can't remember her name, but, um, but anyhow, we went out and found two or three different salespeople. They each did different kinds, like one worked with channels and one got on the phone and, and one was, you know, I was learning all this terminology. One was what they called a direct salesperson. They went out and talked to the customers. And, um, and so we tried, all, you know, one of each. And we said, okay, what can you do? And then, we, you know, we really paid a lot of attention. And, and, uh, and we had to figure out whether they were bad salespeople or whether we didn't have the right market because we weren't really sure which it was. Yeah. And, and that's the hard thing in a startup. And so with trying every approach, we started seeing some traction in places. So we had a sense we had a, we had a, a, a product fit in the market. So then we started, well, I started getting introductions to every VP of sales I could to hear about, you know, what they thought, how we, you know, they all had a completely different way we should set up our sales, but it was really interesting to hear it. You know, I went out and, yeah. you know, studied sales. And, uh, and that was how we developed, um, we realized uh, uh, our CFO at the time, Tom Durowitz, just a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, he and I and this other guy, Jeff Byrne, we came up with this model um, from studying all these different sales organizations all over the place. So they actually teach this model at the Stanford Business School that we came up with. Um, I think Kirk uh, Bowman, Bowman yeah. teaches it. But anyhow, um, we, we said we, we had this really technical product. It was really hard to deploy. And so we um, said we need uh, someone on the phone kind of drumming up business and, and kind of explaining virtualization. We need a sales engineer to go in there and, and find out if, how it's gonna run on their hardware and if they have compatibilities with their storage network and so on. And, and then we need a direct salesperson to close the deal. So we're gonna make these three person sales team and we're gonna give them all one number. Now, the direct sales people always make more money than anybody. And, and the, SE, the SEs make the least amount of, of you know, additional Initial. comp. Yeah. But so they didn't all get the same amount, but, they, but whatever they got was tied to the same number and how that team did. And that worked like a charm. And then the other thing we did that worked like a charm that was a little different from what a lot of people did was um, we said, okay, we want to make you as productive as possible. So if you can go sell with our partners like IBM, Dell, and HP, um, we'll give you the same commission for that sale, even though we don't make as much money because we have to give some money to the hardware vendor. But we're going to make you compensation neutral regardless of what channel you sell through. And we gave them a geographic territory. Yeah. And boy, you know, the smart sales guys... They just went all out educating the channel, helping the channel, and they got you know this really leveraged market where they were making millions of dollars. And I loved paying them the millions yeah. of dollars because it meant VMware was getting even more millions of dollars. And um, you know it was really effective. So I mean, the, the fascinating thing I think two lessons: one, having this triumph of the inside sales rep, the SC, and the direct sales all on the same team, comps in the same number. Number one. Number two, a lot of folks don't realize when you have this indirect channel like a reseller or a, an HP, to say like even the HP sells the deal, you still get paid. Even as they, if you even, direct, if, sale. direct sale. And so you, your incentive was to get as many partners out there on your side. And so the, like I said, the, the self-selecting, the, the smart um, sales executives realized if I could just you know, train a bunch of my channel partners to basically do my work for me, even better. And VMware's able to kind of ride that 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 leverage, if you will. Yeah, yeah, it was great. And then we had no politics, you know, because everybody was in it together and everybody was getting rewarded. So, uh, during this growth, one thing going back to the product side. I mean, my advice is, I think it pays to be generous in sales. It's good. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. And um, on just on the back of the people side, um, let's talk about compensation. But you can't force sales. I mean, you know, if you're not getting traction, hiring more salespeople doesn't help. 
you got to get the model right and you got to get the market fit right. Yeah. But how do you think about compensation? You know, when you, when the new company, the old company, like mm -hmm. cash, equity, you know, salaries, I'd be kind of curious. It's different today. <laughs> You can make <laughs> you can make more money at Google and Facebook and all these you know unicorns. Well, for yeah. the time being, the yeah. unicorns. Um, <laughs> you know, some of them are real, <laughs> but um, it's very real. Um, but anyhow, you can make you know more money there than you can if you come late stage to a startup. Yeah. It didn't used to be the case. How so now the startups yeah. have to take huge amounts of money to pay. A, you know, you can't, if you pay startup wages, these people are going to come out behind where they would have come out had they gone to one of the bigger companies because yeah. the salaries are so high. So you're finding with the new company you have to increase the salaries considerably? Um, well, I haven't had to. I mean, I have this incredible team, but I, I, I actually did a little study on it and I realized this isn't fair. So I took a bunch of money and I started paying people a bunch of money because it wasn't right. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I want to move back to uh, the product side. And, 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 you know, one of the things when we talk about how you keep scaling up, you found this product market failure inside the, the perverted tornado. Um, how do you enable your R&D teams to keep coming disruptive types of technology, like vMotion or live migration or HA or fault tolerance? And even... After the, so the, the, the core virtualization was such a magical piece of technology, you think like, hey, we're done. <laughs> but the VMware product teams didn't stop. The engineering team created yeah. live migration. They created the HA, fault tolerance, re yeah. resource management. So yeah. how, Virtual center. even yeah. at 7,000 people along that, that scale, how do you encourage and, and foster that culture of um, startups within VMware at the time? I mean, we just had exceptional, we really had exceptional people that pushed each other. I mean, I... One thing culturally you want is you want to have people that are self-driven. Like they said, the, I mean, I, even, even the person sitting at the reception desk, you want that to be a driven person. Every single person in the company, no matter what their role, to be someone that likes to set the bar high for themselves. And so I think we had that at VMware. And then we expected it of everybody. And, and I, I have had people say they really enjoyed VMware because they did more than they thought they could do. Yeah. Um, so I think these high expectations are good. They say to do that with your kids too, I don't know. But um, anyhow, um, the we in engineering, I, I don't know if it was real or not, but I always said to our VPs, okay, give me your schedule, but but put a little slack in it so people have some extra time to, to, to kind of play around. You know, don't, don't schedule them to the max. No. Always leave a little slack in the schedule. And I always coached them to do that. I don't know if we knew what we were doing in scheduling enough to really do that, but that was the philosophy. And then we did things like, um, we had uh, these poster sessions. Yep. We would have these little conferences within VMware where people could write a little paper or a little proposal about a new technology and present it, and then the top people would would win something and 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 also get to go build it if we chose it. And and that was really helpful. And and also there was just this sort of fun thing. Like I remember when. Um, you know, when the Mac moved to x86, and everybody's like, we got to build VMware for the Mac. And so I went over, you know, I was trying to talk to Steve Jobs about partnering, and he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He just like, what do you guys get Windows out of my Windows life? Windows on my machine? No, <laughs> never, right? <laughs> and, um, yeah, somebody told me he liked me, but I don't know. <laughs> but anyhow, Apple wouldn't give us the time of day. Yeah. And, um, and so I told everybody, oh, we cannot build this because they don't want us to. It's illegal. But I'd walk around engineering, and I'd see all these Macs, and it was kind of obvious what was going on and I just kind of go what's that Mac there for you but I wouldn't say anything you know so I yeah. I made it really clear that if you were showing initiative and doing good things um we liked that no you weren't going to get in trouble for that ever That's and great. and um I think I didn't even have to do it it was in the culture I mean it was just great people we were lucky yeah we were, we were lucky well there I think two things one it was 
there's always the carrot and the stick, right? So that if you, if you were innovated, I think there was a culture of, of rewarding that. But there's also, I think, with some companies, as you scale up, there's a fear of failure, right? Because if everything's going right, you're fair to try new things. And I don't think we really had that at VMware in those early days because we were trying a bunch of things, and it, people were worried, like, if it worked out, great. If it didn't, we had to slack in the schedule, so to speak. We also, when, when things went wrong, we were always really careful to talk about um, how to prevent it from happening again, but never to say this person screwed up. You know, we never, we never highlighted someone screwing up. We we talked. We did highlight our mistakes, but we divorced it from who it was because it was. We all took responsibility somehow. So it always goes back to the people, and maybe I'll, I'll segue back to that that culture and hiring. Um, I'd be. You know, I'd love to talk about diversity as hiring and, and growing both, you know, gender, um, age, and on. I know it's a topic you and I have talked about a lot. So, you know, how, how did you think about that when you were scaling with VMware? And, and with the new company, how do you think about it now? Well, we had this attitude, any, let's hire everybody we can out of Stanford, yeah. you know. <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, and MIT and Brown and Princeton and a few other schools. So we liked bringing in intern. We actually pioneered that intern program, actually, VJ, our office manager. Uh, back in 1999, we had an intern program where we went out to the colleges and, and uh, recruited people to come before they were graduating to come spend the summer with us if they were a junior. And uh, we made a big deal about it for them. And then if we liked them, we made them an offer. So we got a lot of people that way. It's a little more competitive now. And, um, but, uh, you know, we, we, yeah, we tried as hard as we could to get all kinds of people. It was hard, you know, it was hard to find women. We had a fair number of women. Um, but, um, you know, there wasn't a huge selection, you know, huge pipeline. I, mean, I understand now. You know, it's the biggest major for women in CS here. That's great. Um, yeah. Uh, I was just going to how are you doing the super early stage hiring of a new thing? Is it like 100% personal network this time, or are you using other? So the N question is, um, with Diane's new company, how is she doing hiring the first how set of hires? How am I recruiting? Yeah. It's, well, I mean, the beginning was personal network. How big is the team? Like uh, we're only 36 people. Um, and so there's five former VMware principal engineers <laughs> and a former senior VP. But we also have, uh, well, for instance, design. I mean, I, it took me a while, just like at VMware, when I, my, I had to keep upgrading the VP of sales because I really didn't know what a great VP of sales looked like. And, and it took a while. Be Kirk was a very good VP of sales, and so was Carl. Um, but it took a while to get to them. I had to keep one, I couldn't attract a great one um, because we, d we, we hadn't established ourselves. So as soon as I could upgrade, I would, and, I, and it was a continual process. Um, and so with my current company, I kind of had the same problem in design. You know, I finally had to read about 10 books on design and go hang out in a bunch of mission coffee shops. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, and then I uh, mined my network, and I, you know, asked everybody for any, de you know, great designer that they knew. And I finally found a fabulous head of design, someone that was running design at Walmart Labs. And uh, um, uh, so that was just going out very specifically to a bunch of people saying, I need someone to run my design. Um, I did bring in a recruiter. We have an in-house recruiter. Um, but she doesn't really tend to, s I mean, <laughs> I recently, this is my favorite hire. Someone sent me a designer resume, and I was looking at it on LinkedIn. And on the side popped up a picture that this woman, I was like, wow. She has so much energy and drive. I really like her. And I looked at her, and she was a designer. So I sent her to my recruiter. I said, see if you can, see if you can get her in. And it was purely based on the picture. And <laughs> Too bad Reed's not here tonight. You know? I know. <laughs> it was so amazing. So we, we hired her. And, and uh, she's an amazing designer. 
And she told me that her husband is in advertising and he took the picture. So he's very proud of that picture. <laughs> Isn't that a great That's story? That's an amazing story. Yeah. Let's talk. I would love to just maybe spend more to your sec on a design, this user experience layer, which it's, you know, VMware built this great platform. And now you and, and Mendel are, are spending a lot of time understanding user ex UX, HCI, human computer interface. Well, and also this layer, it's a mess. Yeah. The layer, you know, above, you know, like this HTML, CSS, iOS, Android, and, and, and how you talk to the back end and the database and update things and, you yeah. know, separate the database from the front end. It's, it's, um, it's an area of the system that, that everybody thought, oh, that's, you know, real software computer scientists do systems. They yeah. don't do that upper layer. So nobody's really, not a lot of people have worked very hard on it. And, um, and then HTML, of course, was never designed for what it's being used for. So that's a little bit difficult. And, and uh, so, so we've got, and it's incredibly difficult to test this stuff. Yep. And, and, uh, and then you have to be able to rapidly iterate because you can't get your design right because humans are so hard to predict. Some yeah. people think machine learning's gonna do the design someday. But um, uh, the, so anyhow, I think it's, I think design, well, we're, we're designing complex interfaces where you have lots of roles and lots of workflows and, and communications and collaboration and access controls and, and to make that simple and easy to use um, and rapidly iterate on that and test it all. Um, we've, ha we've had to build a lot of um, stuff to That's support great. that, yeah. So find the right, again, so core, interesting, we talk about founders and the first like ex hires early or people you know, you trust, and then you find folks that are or, or purpose with that skill like design or user experience and bring them in to the I mean, the there's the product person and the user yeah. researcher and the designer. And then, uh, you know, there's some designers that are kind of product people and there's some, you guys all know this, some designers yeah. that are uh, right, can write, Code, yeah. can build the, yeah. the UI. And then there's front end people that are sort of full stack people and there's front end people that only do front end or there's front end people that also do design. And you have all these different kinds of people. And, um, and, and, and then there's this whole process to bring it all together that's, um, you know, I guess all this agile development is designed to try and help that, but it's not, it's not trivial. I, uh, my husband's teaching a course in this. Um, we've gotten so interested in how to do this better. He's well, teaching the course in the winter. I would yeah. compare notes to Mendel. We're looking at a bunch of stuff in that space, too. Yeah. Uh, maybe to a oh, question. Let me re rephrase the question. Is um, it's a great question. So, uh, VMware is a platform, maybe, and a lot of these large companies now make a decision if you work on this platform or not. And in the early days, did VMware aim to be this platform for IT that became you know such a standard, and or, or not? And when do you, when do you, when do you just make the decision, or or how do you fall into that? Mm-hmm. Well. It was not all premeditated. Uh, I won't take credit for that. But, but we did believe right from the beginning that this should run on every piece of hardware. Uh, we were so sure this was a better way to run systems. We said, look, this should really run everywhere. And so we did think of it as a platform from day one to run. I mean, that's part of why we were neutral with the hardware vendors and uh, just a lot of decisions we made about what to support and not support were based on the fact that we sh thought it it needed to be a platform uh, 
uh, to be to maximize its value to people. And and uh, but what we found, what the beauty of VMware was, it was useful on a single server. So someone could try it out, and just some sysadmin would use it, just standalone, and and it would kind of spread virally through a company in little tiny pockets and we could kind of see where it was going. So so we we actually didn't want to go to the decision maker right away because there's the, the the I mean the CEO type person because they always have this person called the purchasing agent and their job, their only job is to get as big a discount as possible. And they're compensated on how much of a discount they get. So you kind of want to stay away from that guy. And so, particularly at a place like General Electric, you know, big, huge company. And so, um, so we would let it just kind of spread. And our salespeople would kind of map out the organization. And, and if they saw a hole where they weren't using it, they'd go in and try and get it there. But we'd try and... And then we'd wait till it was kind of all over the organization. And then we'd go in and say, hey, look what's going on. Would you like an enterprise license agreement? And we would monetize it that way, but we would wait. And, and, um, but we didn't consciously say, we're going to be strategic to the CIO. What we consciously said was, this is going to run on every single piece of hardware. And, and that was... You know, we didn't put two and two together to say, well, that's what's going to happen. We, but happily, it did. Yeah. W one of the results of there's the, a uh, question in the back. Yeah. That's funny. I thought you were asleep back there. And you woke up. Well, so th the question is, um, Diane's thoughts on virtualization now, containers, and Docker. He's the world expert on Docker. I'll just, so I'll let him say a little bit, but I'll just say that we couldn't do a container at that point in time because um, we had to be completely non disruptive. We had to make it like, um, you know, nobody believed in virtualization. Nobody believed in this kind of separation. So basically, you know, we, we, we actually built a tool, a, a P to V tool. You know, nobody was going to build for a virtual machine. So we, we built a little tool that, that grabbed a physical machine and plopped it in a virtual machine by, you know, pushing a button. We had another tool we built that went out on your network and saw the utilization of all your servers, and we'd say these are really good candidates for virtualization. Um, you know, the, you couldn't have... You know, people do things incrementally. They don't see the value. And, and so VMware showed the value of putting things in containers big time. But it's a fairly heavyweight mechanism that, that now that everybody appreciates the value and wants to do it, you can, you know, you can kind of do these lighter weight containers. Uh, and I'll let Jerry talk about what he, I mean, he's going to tell you Docker's going to own the world. Um, there's also this Kubernetes. 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 And uh, so the full disclosure is um, I left VMware in 2013, joined Greylock. My first investment was in Docker. So I, was, uh, I, uh, I am um, two reasons for that. It was a great that. investment, yeah. Thank you. Well, tiers one, I, I watched firsthand what Diane Mendel and the rest of the company built at VMware for, for a decade, and I um, saw the value of Docker and, and containers were bringing as kind of uh, the next wave, the next evolution. So I think they're... they're um, I'm really excited we talk separately about Docker because I know the class is focused on um, learning from Diane, but I think both Diane and the board of Google that's very involved in the kind of the container ecosystem, we're both very bullish on on Docker and containers in that ecosystem. Um, it's she always wanted to do something in the lightest weight possible yeah. way, but but there wasn't a market for it before VMware. And yeah, you know, Docker would not exist if it wasn't for VMware. Yeah. Right. yeah. Question? Over the radar. So what is the trade-off or what is the balance between the two dynamics? 
Well, the, so the, just for yeah. the, the, quest, the question is, uh, VMware stayed under the radar for many, many years, um, both in marketing and awareness, and the culture was um, over-deliver, right? Just like be very understanding. Under-promise. Under, so. under, under, over, under-promise, over-deliver. Yeah. And um, the question was, now you see a lot of startups out there that are called over-the-radar, that they <laughs> over-promise and under-deliver. Um, and, and, but definitely, definitely there's, a, there's a marketing around some companies that out there and so yeah so I think um, the advantage there's a lot of advantages to under promise over deliver the, uh, the advantages are that you set your pace and you do things when they're ready and and how you want them and um, you can also build trust because you don't bother to deliver till it's ready I mean you don't try and deliver until it's ready and so people come to trust your brand and trust the quality of your product. Uh, some pro- I mean, and we were building a product that everybody was going to run all their software on, so they had to trust it. We needed to be a trustworthy. That was an important part of our brand was to be a trustworthy company. Um, and, and it was just a lot less stressful and, and, and just a nicer way to operate because if our engineers said, oh, wait a minute, we got to change something here. We could take the time to do it. And we hadn't, like, promised something to the market and, and ta- you know, forcing us to take shortcuts. Um, the, the advantages of making a lot of noise, well, certainly if you have competition, it, it helps to make a lot of noise. And, and sometimes, you know, you can, I mean, there's, I won't name companies, but I, there are some companies that have, um, done it that way and been super successful. Um, <laughs> somebody once said to me, you know, Diane, if you took you and Mark Benny off and put the two of you together, you'd really have something. <laughs> I'll, I'll invest in that. <laughs> he's a very, he's an extraordinary genius at marketing. Yeah, yes. Well, well, let's talk about... Um, marketing of VMware in, in the early days to the question, VMware didn't market very much at all. And then all of a sudden in 2004, we cr- created VMworld, this, this conference and 1,400 people the first year, then 3,000 the next year. Now it's over 20,000 people. And I remember setting up chairs in the first year. I set up <laughs> chairs in the last year too. too. I remember you like the night before making my slides. <laughs> that's, a, that's a separate comment, but yes. Um, I remember the night before making your slides at the first VMworld. How, but you made that an industry event, right? Not a VMware event. And, and at a company that's less than a thousand people at the time, that's pretty, pretty ambitious. Well, again, we, we, you know, I really believe this stuff belonged on every machine. I really believed that, and I also really believed for it to be valuable to people. Uh, you know, it had to be very open. You had to let anybody participate and it had to be about virtualization not about VMware and and so it was totally open to anybody that wanted to come and it was just run with our partners in a very open way and so I just I I wanted it to focus on bringing virtualization to the world and I was you know we had the virtualization solution nobody was going to compete with our virtualization solution so it was a pretty safe thing to do from a company building standpoint and it just felt really it was really fun to do it that way yeah well, I, I remember those slides There's the message from day one yeah. was yeah. We were, we're creating this new industry and you could write ri- the rising tide would float everyone yeah. partners in VMware included and yeah. it, was, it was amazing what happened um, and so the, the 20,000 people later to the platform question then he had vendors building um, entire startup ecosystem appeared around VMware large companies yeah. small companies um, how do you think about... Yeah, I mean, over that. and over again, we did the generous thing, and it always paid off. You know, whether it was with our own people, with the partners, it just seemed to pay off. Well, this ecosystem spread around VMware. And one, one question I want to ask you is, some companies now, when they're in the hyper-growth phase, try to buy other companies, big and small, to, to get mass. And VMware never did a big acquisition. It was small tech ones here and there, but they never had to in those in those days. And... Um, I'm curious your philosophy around um, M&A for startups or, or just scale-ups as well as they're growing. When does that make sense? When that doesn't make sense? 
Well, I think VMware was a little bit unique in that we were creating this new industry, so there wasn't really anything to buy. I mean, as we got further along and there started being, there started being companies to buy, and I don't think we did a very good job at, at those acquisitions, in all honesty. Yeah. And because um, uh, we, you know, we didn't have experience, we didn't know how to do it. Um, and although we knew how to manage our own, I thought we knocked that one out of the park. But um, um, yeah. <laughs> anyhow, um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's a company out there, Domo, and that started with an acquisition, and I think he did several acquisitions, and I think he's doing really well. So, so number one, if you're a startup and you've never done an acquisition, yeah. I think it's a really bad idea because they're super hard to make success. I mean, very experienced companies blow it all the time. Most of the time, right? Most, yeah. you know, yeah. probably 95% of the time they don't work out so well. And, and, and so, you, you know, you really have to know what you're doing. And then, and, and, and then, um, you know, it has to, you have to know what will work, <laughs> what kind of a fit. And, and I, you know, the guy running Domo, I forget his name. I Josh think James. he's just very yeah. talented at it. Josh, yeah, Josh yeah. is. Yeah. And just speaking of, of, of you know, growing, so there's, you said early, you should avoid M&A if you don't know what you're doing because oftentimes they don't work out. If, if a big company can't be successful as a startup or scale up, you know, you should not think you're either. Um, it's a big distraction because they're mm -hmm. very time consuming. And the smaller you are, the bigger a uh, distraction Culture, relative. Culture, people, yeah. Yeah. right? How do you think about organizations and, and reconciling the two? Um, one of the comments, just think about marketing, how we scaled in sales in conjunction. You said something about upgrading VPs of sales or your execs. When did you know it was time to upgrade? Was it because they, they missed a metric or performance or you felt like they weren't managing folks well? What, what, what kind of sign? Well, it was always something different. Yeah. So, and not just sales, could be engineering, could be anyone in your exec team. How do you think about yeah. upgrading people? Well, I can give some specific examples. Um, so our first sales guy, who ended up staying at the company, yeah. um, but he came to me when we were doing $10 million in revenue, and, and uh, we were planning, and he said, Diane, there's just not that much here. You're going to be lucky to get this to $20 million. And that was when I knew it was time to upgrade my sales guy. I'm like, no, I, I know we can do much, much better than this. So I, so I kept him as a sales guy, but I went and got a new VP of sales. And, and uh, the next one, um, I caught lying. I had a VP of marketing that um, I walked out the door because uh, Intel sent me a mail he had sent them, and he had sent them all our confidential stuff trying to get them to buy the company. <laughs> and so I came to his desk and said, come on, <laughs> we're going to your car. <laughs> and that was that. And, um, and, um, and then, you know, s s s you know, so really anything can happen in a company. You know, it's always amazing the kinds of things that go on. But um, the... You know, if if someone is not being treated like a leader, like if 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 you have someone that nobody's listening to, you yeah. know, that's a pretty sure sign that you don't have the right leader. If people, I always had a really open door. Our first VP of engineering, you know, people were just getting more and more frustrated, saying that he won't make a decision, he won't make a decision, and and and. You know, the the old maxim is so true. You you know, when you fire someone, you never go, oh, I wish I'd waited longer. <laughs> you always go, oh, yeah. why didn't I do that sooner? Yeah. Yeah. Bad news never gets better with time. But you don't, the, the thing I always tell people is when you fire someone, it doesn't have to, well, unless they just send all your IP over to somebody at another company and then it's personal, but um, <laughs> but otherwise, it's not personal. And I always talk about the fact that 
you know, you're going to be happier somewhere else. I'll help. You know, I hired you for a reason. I thought you were talented. I still believe you're talented. You're just not a good fit here. Let me help you find another role. And I've remained friends with a lot of people I've fired. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just wondering if you could talk about some of the other things you've done differently intentionally with the new company, either like you as a CEO or just in the company in general. So the question is... Um, things that Diana has constantly done differently with her new, new company? Well, one thing, I, I mean, it's such a different climate now. I did this radical thing, you know, it's, which I never would have, I would have told someone they were an idiot to do this. Um, you know, it's so hard to hire, and the traffic between here and San Francisco is really intense and 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 my initial group had some people that lived up in San Francisco and out in San Ramon and some people that lived down in San Jose and Cupertino and whatnot so we um, made a decision to get two offices from day one and uh, then we said two days a week we're one office is in Los Altos and one's in downtown San Francisco and we said two days a week we're in Los Altos and two days a week we're in San Francisco and when you're small you can get an office big enough to hold everybody and and that's what we do and then one day a week anybody everybody can be wherever they want to be. Entire companies two days in Los Altos two days in SF. Recently we've been sla is letting people yeah. do one day because we know each other so well. Yep. But yeah, that, so that was a pretty wild thing to do but it took all the friction out of hiring. It was really valuable. So the, the question is, um, Diane's a board member of Google. What's a, a cultural thing that Google does really well that she wish she had at VMware, and vice versa? Is there what's a cultural thing VMware had that she wish Google has more of? Well, I think I think Google w was bolder. They knew not to sell, and I wish VMware had had that. <laughs> um, although I didn't want to sell, but you know, it was just uh, Google has. And it's gotten even better. I mean, there's just a, a, a real boldness, you know, incredible quality, incredible people, but boldness about Google and, and really culturally we're going to do the right thing. Do, you know, it's real. You know, we want to help the world. And, and I really like that. And we, we felt that way at VMware, but it wasn't quite as strong culturally as it is at Google. Um, something I thought think we did better at VMware, although we weren't at the same scale, so I think it's a little harder at 65,000 people. So I'm not sure I could have done it e at 65,000 if we'd gotten VMware that far. But um, I feel like, um, actually, I'm not going to say. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can say in private. Yeah. The best piece of advice I ever received was, um, you can never over-communicate. <laughs> um, you know, I was at this startup and uh, that I uh, had a major disagreement, a little startup that did streaming video, and I had a ma major disagreement with um, the other founders. I wanted to build software, they wanted to build hardware, you know, and so I, I left. And um, one of the board members said to me, he goes, you shouldn't leave. This is, this is the biggest deal you'll ever be part of. <laughs> I always remembered that. <laughs>
Well, the sad truth is I was pretty old when I found a VM where I wasn't an undergraduate. I'm so flattered that you think I'm that young. But well, the, question, the question is um, <laughs> steps that Diane was thinking about before she found a VMware. Okay, so VMware, but I will tell you. Um, so VMware was actually the third, my third startup. Uh, and so, um, Actually, my husband Mendel had invented this technology, and he was working on it with his grad student, or invented this idea, and they were building the technology with his grad students. And, and uh, the first thing that happened was they put out a paper, and, and all these people at Microsoft, like Bill G and Nathan M and so on, he got a letter from somebody, it was under blind review, somebody at University of Washington wanted to know if all these people could read it, they'd be very interested to read it. And I thought, wow, we, you should get a patent file before you, you know, do anything else. This was just, they were, st it was just in the graduate school. Um, in his research group, and and so anyhow, as it went along, I you know, we, I said I th I really think we should take this to market. This is this is really neat, and uh, you know I start talking with my husband Mendel about all the different ways it could be used, and I'm like this should really get taken to market, and so we had the grad students over, and. Uh, I won't go into the details. We had a discussion with them about whether they wanted to do it. They had some other ideas, but in the end, they decided to do it. And and um, uh, about that time, I found out I was uh, pregnant with our second kid. So I said, "Okay, I've built. You know, I've been involved in two startups. I know how to do it because both had had good outcomes. And and um, so I'll help get this off the ground. But I just, you know, I got a." four-year-old and I'm about to have another baby, this isn't gonna work for me, but let me get the company going and then we'll bring in a CEO. And, and we had this vision of what we were gonna do and that it should be, you know, virtualization should be on all hardware and that we would come in with, um, you know, the desktop as a way, you know, the whole thing I've described here. Uh, and, and because one of my previous startups had been a little dysfunctional, um, one of the first things I did when we started, I said, okay, we have to write our vision and our mission and everybody needs to sign it. And I'm not, we're not doing anything else till we do that because I had learned a, a hard lesson and we did that and, um, and we started building the company and, um, and then I, you know, I had my baby and we were living, we were in this office this isn't really answering your question, but I'll just finish this little story. But we were in this office where you could open the windows, and so I just brought my baby in, and because uh, she could get fresh air, and 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 you know, not much was going on. We didn't have any customers. I I was just <laughs> negotiating a, a license with Phoenix for a BIOS that we needed. That was all I was doing, really, and hiring people and getting facility. You know, I I s did I answer your question? Okay, so you had a qu question there, what's hard about scaling? Yeah, well, One of the hardest things about scaling VMware, ironically, the thing I remember as the hardest was space. Having enough yeah. space for everybody. Yeah. And anticipating it, because you know, when people get overcrowded, they don't work very well. And, and it was during the bubble and, and, and uh, rents went up to $10 a square foot per month. Yeah. And you know that's what put Donna Dubinsky out of business. She signed a long-term yeah. lease at that rate, and that's why she had to sell Palm. And and I mean it was agony because we were get, you know it was just constant agony having enough space. And, and also that balancing committing to a long-term lease at the time. Oh yeah, you didn't know what to do, and you know, and we we didn't do it, and luckily the bubble burst, and we we were so lucky. Uh, even then, the, the hyper growth and companies are facing this now, and, and how to plan. The space is also um, physical space is culture, right? In terms of two offices for yeah. a startup, like where people are, and you want a space that is early that people can collaborate, work together, or, or two spaces. And I remember we went through office defrag a lot, where we kept reshuffling. We had multiple offices, and we yeah. kept redoing every six months. And I remember one office move, I opened a box, and it, it was not my stuff, my office made from two moves ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
<laughs> and he had left the company. I'm like, oh, I have all of Jeff's stuff, you know. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. So maybe I'll just – we're running out of time. So let me just last thoughts. Uh, in terms of um, scaling up besides space, uh, if you give a piece of advice to, to students or entrepreneurs about the – you know, one or two things to be thoughtful about that would be helpful? Um, uh, shoot, I forgot to think about that. Um, <laughs> you know, everything I can think of is so darn trite, you know, about, you know, concentrating on on doing something you're really interested in, you know, and can be excited about, and uh, no matter what you do. You know, one thing I have thought about lately, which is that you can be an entrepreneur anywhere. You don't have to start a company to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I think it's a little problematic. Every, you know, I do talk at a lot of schools when I travel, and, and I'll ask everybody how many are going to start a company, and Everybody will raise their hand, and guess what problem that creates? Nope. There's nobody to hire because everybody's starting a company, and 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 uh, and so, you know, I think it's wonderful to build something, but you can build incredible. Th I mean, I was an entrepreneur before I started companies. The only reason I left the big companies to start my own companies was because they didn't have great companies back then. And, and you know, the companies were so horrible, they would just not do new, I mean, they weren't that horrible. I was at, Tandem was a good company, but they wouldn't do new things. They were so, you know, afraid of, you know, they wouldn't jump off that elephant. They'd ride it right over the cliff. And, um, and so, 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 so I, th I guess maybe part of my advice, and I don't know if you think this way or not, which is, you know, if you have an idea and you want to build something, you know, figure out the best environment to do that in. And it might be starting a company and it might be doing it as part of something bigger. And, and uh, what's really important is who you're with and what you're building. And you can get, you know, tremendous, sa I mean, I, I think some of my most satisfying things I did were not, I mean, I, VMware was incredibly satisfying and fun. I wouldn't trade it for the world, but I did a lot of other things I really enjoyed that were at bigger companies. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.